Welcome back. So in the next couple of lectures, I'm going to show you how to use the Fourier transform, the fast Fourier transform, to compress images. Okay, so this is one of the coolest and most useful applications of the FFT in our modern world uh, is, is using the FFT for compression in general. You can use it for audio compression, for image compression. Uh, when you stream TV or movies or YouTube, uh, you're using some kind of a Fourier transform-based uh, compression algorithm. Okay, uh, and I'm going to start with compression based on the fast Fourier transform, and then I'm going to eventually move on to the wavelet transform, which is kind of an enhanced uh, Fourier transform that's better for compressing natural signals like audio and images. Okay, but before I do, I need to point out um, this is not just the standard FFT in Python or MATLAB. This is actually the FFT two. It's a two-dimensional FFT if we're going to be doing uh, compression on two-dimensional images. So I'm going to walk you through. Uh, kind of how you can think about this um, this two-dimensional uh, FFT. Okay, so let's say you have some some picture. Um, I'm gonna say I don't know. This is a picture of my dog Mort. That's Mort. That looks like a pig. Okay, fine. That's a pig. Uh, and we're going to Fourier transform this pig. So the first thing is just how do you compute a two-dimensional FFT? Then I'll show you how to use that for compression. Okay. So the first thing is the uh, FFT2 command. FFT2. And essentially, what you do in an FFT2, this is super simple. You just FFT every row, and then you FFT every column, or vice versa. It doesn't really matter. So the first step is we're going to FFT every single row. Okay, so this is just FFT uh, on rows. And we're going to get some new image. And I can't draw this image because it's in uh, some weird Fourier transform in space. It's going to look, uh, it's going to look messy, some, some weird messy Fourier image. Okay. And then once I've Fourier transformed all the rows, I'm going to Fourier transform all of the columns of that new image. So now I'm going to FFT all of the columns. Okay, so we're going to FFT columns. And that is going to be how we FFT to an image. So this is the FFT uh, of an image. And I'm going to draw it kind of like this because that's... Uh, how I think of it, there's usually you're going to see when you FFT an image, there's going to be this kind of plus sign and then some stuff uh, everywhere else. And I'll, I'll explain that later. Okay. But the basic idea is if you want to compute the FFT to the, the FFT of a two dimensional image, you FFT all the rows, then you FFT all of the columns uh, and you get this, um, this representation. And the way you can think about this simply is just like if I FFT'd uh, a one-dimensional signal, like an audio signal, I'm representing that as a sum of sines and cosines in that one-dimensional variable. Here, I'm representing this picture uh, of this pig as a sum of a bunch of sines and cosines in x and y. So you can think of um, each Fourier coefficient here, every single Fourier coefficient here, corresponds to a particular spatial wave number. This corresponds to some uh, you know, cosine kx times sine, I don't know, jy, where this is the k and j coordinate of this thing. And if you think about it, I always imagine um, four people holding a, a bed sheet and kind of forcing it, you know, in one direction at a frequency of k and forcing it in the other direction at a frequency of j. And it would create this kind of standing wave. Um, I guess this doesn't have to be cosine sine. This could be cosine cosine or each of these has a phase. This could be cosine kx times cosine ky or sine kx times sine jy or whatever. It doesn't matter, um, cosines and sines. But the basic idea is that you know, every single point in this two-dimensional Fourier transform has an x frequency and a y frequency. And that's giving you this kind of standing wave uh, bed sheet structure. And you're going to add all of those up to get um, kind of the pixel intensities of this original signal. And I'm going to talk a lot more about this. We're going to, I'm going to work, work through some examples. We're going to see this working in MATLAB and in Python. Okay? But the basic idea is you Fourier transform all the rows, all the columns, and then you get this two-dimensional FFT. In Python and MATLAB, uh, it's kind of a built-in command to do this. Fun exercise uh, for you at home would be to convince yourself that it doesn't matter what order you do this operation. You could do the FFT on columns first, 
and then do the FFT on the rows, or vice versa, and you're going to get the exact same uh, two-dimensional Fourier transform. So I think uh, you should convince yourself of that. Okay. Good. But now I want to show you how you would use this for uh, compression. This is, um, this is really cool. I'm going to show you kind of mathematically how you use this for compression, and then we're going to code this up uh, in the next few uh, lectures in Python and in MATLAB. So the basic idea is that when you have your image, this is in uh, image space, and maybe this is a megapixel image, so it's got one million pieces of information. Um, maybe this time I'll draw a cat. Okay, that's a cat. Um, happier than most cats I've seen. Okay, so what we're gonna do, let's say that this is kind of one megapixel image of a cat. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to uh, Fourier transform this thing. That's a curly F, FFT. We're gonna FFT to this image, and we're gonna get, uh, again, a million kind of Fourier coefficients. So now in Fourier, we still have a million Fourier coefficients, and I'm always gonna draw it like uh, something like this. It's not exactly what it looks like. But the basic idea is that you have a lot of Fourier coefficients, but we have observed, and, and this doesn't have to be true, this is not obvious why this is true, this just happens to be true, is that all, almost all natural images, things that you would see, like, um, and not, not just nat natural like a mountain or a stream or a field, but like this pen or what you see right here, this, uh, this lightboard studio or a picture of a coffee cup or a cat, images that you would see with your eyes, generally when you Fourier transform them, most of the Fourier coefficients are really, really small. This doesn't have to be true, but this is true. Okay, so most of these Fourier coefficients are very, very, very small, negligibly small, and you can truncate them and throw them away. So all of these Fourier coefficients, these million Fourier coefficients, maybe only 10,000 of them are large. And so I can zero out 99% of those Fourier coefficients. I can threshold them out manually, make them exactly equal to zero, Okay, so that's what we're gonna do is we're gonna threshold. Uh, and what I mean is we're only gonna maybe keep 1% of the largest, uh, largest Fourier coefficients. So now, uh, and it's a little hard to draw this, but usually what that means is now it's like only just the very, very largest ones, uh, Fourier coefficients in this original image. We're gonna keep like 1% or 2% or something like that. And the, the magic is that if you throw away really, really small Fourier coefficients, you're thresholding them, when you inverse Fourier transform, this is the IFFT2, when you inverse Fourier transform, there is very little loss in your original image. Okay, so this is, um, I don't know if you remember Parseval's theorem, but Parseval's theorem says, that uh, there's kind of a relationship between the energy in Fourier space and the energy in signal in pixel space. And so if I'm only throwing away, I'm throwing away a lot of these Fourier coefficients, 99% of the Fourier coefficients, but the ones I'm throwing away are so small that they don't actually change the norm or the energy of this, uh, of this, this signal very much because I'm only throwing away the ones that are almost zero anyway. And so if Parseval's theorem tells me is that if I only threshold the very, very small Fourier coefficients, it has negligible uh, degradation of my original image. Okay, and this is the basis of all image compression is the, and audio compression, is this idea that when you Fourier transform your signal, your audio or image signal, most of those Fourier transform coefficients are very, very small, negligibly small, and because of Parseval's theorem, if I zero out those small Fourier coefficients and I only keep the largest ones, which oftentimes is only 1% or 2% of these Fourier coefficients, if I only keep those, then when I inverse Fourier transform, the image looks almost identical to the original full resolution image, okay? Now, you might be asking, why does this actually give you a compression? Well, when I take a megapixel image, um, actually on my phone, I think it's like eight or 12 megapixels now, I'm storing a million pieces of information, a million pixels of information. And if I Fourier transformed, there are still a million pieces of information here. But when I threshold and I only keep 1% of these Fourier coefficients, here, this is where the compression 
uh, comes in. So when you save a JPEG image on your phone or on your computer, you're not saving the million pixels. You are saving only the one or 2% largest Fourier coefficients. This is JPEG. Okay, and so on your hard drive, you don't have a million pieces of information. You only maybe have 10 or 20,000 pieces of information corresponding to the largest Fourier coefficients and essentially the IJ or the JK locations of where those Fourier coefficients are. So this is basically a list of, you know, K comma J comma F hat. K comma J comma F hat. This is just a big list on your hard drive of only the 1% or 2% largest Fourier coefficients that you need to keep, okay? And that's actually why the fast part of the fast Fourier transform is so important, is that if you had to do an order n squared expensive Fourier transform and inverse Fourier transform, this would be too expensive to decompress your image. So when you have a JPEG on your, on your phone, and, and you, you click on it or you open it, it immediately, almost instantaneously decodes it into pixel space so that you can see it. But it's going very, very flexibly from this uh, sparse compressed representation to this full megapixel representation because it can compute this Fourier transform very rapidly. Okay, so if it wasn't for the fast Fourier transform, even though we could still compress images, it would take forever to compress them and it would take forever to decompress them. So, so the F, uh, the first F in the FFT is why we can do this, this image compression uh, so ubiquitously. Okay, uh, so just to summarize, you can take the Fourier transform of two dimensional images, just Fourier transform all rows and then all columns. Uh, and then what we find is that when we Fourier transform natural images that you see in nature, uh, things that you would see with your eyes, generally they are very, very sparse in Fourier space. So you can get away with truncating or throwing away most of those small Fourier coefficients. And by only keeping maybe the top one or 2% of these Fourier modes, you get a massive compression. You have to store less on your hard drive. You have to transfer less when you text someone a picture. Uh, and because of the fast Fourier transform, you can invert or decompress uh, that representation very efficiently into the original image. Okay, so in the next couple of lectures, we're going to code this up in Python and in MATLAB, and we're going to kind of get a little bit better feeling for, uh, you know, why this is compressible, how it's compressible, and what different features, uh, why some images are more compressible than others. Um, and so that's all coming up. Thank you.